Hey there, everybody. We're going to get started here in just a second. I need to get our live stream going into the Facebook group. So that will take just a second here. In the meantime, just a little quick housekeeping. You want to make sure you have all other streaming devices turned off so you have the maximum available bandwidth while we're on live together. So if you've got Google Drive, Spotify, Netflix, any of those things running, turn them off now. Also, um, just want to point out where the chat roll is. So if you're looking down here at the bottom of the screen, go across and there's a little idea bubble with three dots. That is where the chat roll is. Let me get this typed in for the group and then we'll pop right on in. There, that should get that going. So the idea bubble with the three dots in it is the chat roll. Click on that, and this is only if you're joining via the live Zoom link. When you click on that, up will come the chat roll. You can type your questions in there, and I'll be able to see them. Make sure that you change the little blue button from panelist to panelist and attendees. When you do that, it makes it so everybody can see all of your comments and questions. Because one of the things that's valuable about being online live together in a group like this is being able to exchange ideas and share information. And that's not gonna happen unless you can see everything. So make sure that blue button is switched from all panelists to all panelists and attendees. So we can all see everything. Awesome. Hey, Tracy, it's good to see you. So make sure all of those are in there and know that if you um, have a question that you want to ask during the course of the presentation, go on and type it in at that time. And I, if it's right on where we need to address it right then, I'll stop and, and answer your question right then. Otherwise, I'll give some time at the end to make sure we get to all of the questions that people might have. And that applies for everybody over here in the Facebook group as well. So let me make sure that is streaming correctly. And it is awesome sauce. And as we've done before, Carson will be handing off any questions that come up in the group on Facebook so that we can get everybody's questions answered. So first off, I wanna dive into uh, a little quick overview, pull up my notes here, little quick overview of um, what we've talked about so far. So remember in the first video, we talked about the importance and power of building a platform, of having your own platform, and that the platform's made up of three things, your website, your social hub, and your email list and how crucial those three things are. They are the core of creating an online platform and business that will lead to success along the path you've picked and turn you into a thriving artist. You've got to have those three things, no matter how you define success. Second thing we talked about in video two was about your engaged audience and the strategies that you can use to build that audience. Today in video three, we're gonna be talking about the offer and how you invite your audience to participate in that offer. So, yes, Susan, I have other glasses. These aren't new, they're just other ones. <laughs> I broke my other ones last weekend or last week, so have to wear the others. So, what we're talking about today is the offer the offer and how you're going to invite your audience to participate in it. So the offer is the package that you wrap your product up in. And there's a lot of misconception around that. People tend to think about the offer as being just the thing they sell, the, the product, the painting, the print, the monotype, the sculpture, whatever that is, the course. That's the product, it's not the offer. So the offer is 
the product or service and the whole surrounding experience. It's that entire experience that your audience goes through on the way to becoming a customer. It's the, if you're selling a, a physical product in a store, for example, if you go to a shop and you're gonna buy a new pair of shoes, the offer is not just the pair of shoes. It's also the box that the shoes come in, the service that you get from the staff who are waiting on you. It's the guarantee about the fit of the shoes. And it's the entire experience of being in the store. That's the offer. So does everybody understand that the offer is more than the product? It's the first mistake I see people making when they're trying to have an exchange online, a financial exchange online or in person, is that they misunderstand what it is that they're doing with the offer and the product. So understand that that is more than the product or service, it's the entire experience. So there, there's a lot of talk in conversation when you're studying marketing about the P's and that's uh, an idea that there's a list of P's that have to do with, and I'm not talking about legumes, P's that have to do with marketing your offer. And you wanna reduce those down because I think people pad that out too much pretty much to three basic things. It's the product, it's the thing, the, the killer offer, it's the promise, it's the transformation. So this is actually gonna be four things. It's the product, it's the promise, it's what you're promising them that they're gonna get from purchasing that product. And it's the process, it's what is unique about you, because each one of us does something better than somebody else. We've all got our own, what I like to call unique ability. What is your, and I'm making that one word, your unique ability, what is your uniqueness out in the world? Kind of relates and is aligned with that talk that we had last time about the niche. In what way are you do different from everybody else in the world? I promise you, you are. So product, promise, process, and the price. What is the price? What do people get for that price? Price is not necessarily money. Did you hear that? Price is not necessarily money. It's what's being exchanged. So if you think about, for example, a grant proposal. You're an artist and you have written a grant proposal to fund an upcoming painting project. So your product that you are trying to sell to the granting agency is this new upcoming project. The offer is everything that surrounds accomplishing that project. It might be the paintings you're gonna create, it's the exhibition you're gonna hold for the paintings, it's the artist talks that you're gonna do in the gallery, it's the interaction you're gonna have with your audience on the internet as you create the project. This comes to mind really quickly because we just talked about this within the Painter's Path for a student who is writing a grant proposal right now and has successfully written other grant proposals. It's the whole thing. It's not just the paintings. It's that whole package that's wrapped up that becomes an offer. And you are trying to market that offer to the granting agency and whoever's sitting on the grant panel. So you have to convince them of the four Ps, that your product is valid and worthwhile, that the promise, the transformation that you're promising is one that you can deliver, and that the process is very unique to you, and that the price is worth the transformation. That's where price and transformation are related. So back to the grant example. So you have a series of paintings that you're gonna do. 
and you, an exhibition of those paintings and a gallery talk, and you're gonna document the whole project from beginning to end on your website. So the process, the thing that it, the grant agency, the whole package, the offer that they're purchasing is your ability to deliver that experience to a wider audience and have an impact. In return, they will give you X number of dollars. That's the price. It might have been something else. The price is not always dollars. The price can be recognition. The price can be um, status. The price can be all sorts of things. It's what you're getting in exchange for delivering your offer. So it holds true no matter what your success path is, whether you're talking about selling paintings to collectors, funding grant proposals with granting agencies, writing a book, shout out to Lisa Atkinson, hope you're online today. Lisa's one of my students and just had her, her book hit top of the charts. So proud of you for doing that. It, there are all sorts of different paths that you can take to achieve success. All of them involve an offer. And once you get clarity on that, then deciding what path you're gonna to take to market, sell, and deliver that offer becomes a whole lot clearer. So let's go back to those main ingredients for the offer. The product, the promise, the process, and the price. All are crucial components. That makes up the offer, that's the package. So there are four components that you need to think about in coming up with that offer that are gonna help it to be in alignment with you. Any of y'all and shout out yes or no into the chat roll or the comments. Any of y'all ever had trouble selling something? So anybody ever feel, felt funky selling something? Anybody at all? Yeah, Beth says yes. Absolutely, it can be daunting to sell something. When it's hard to sell, it's because of a lack of confidence. And it, that lack of confidence usually comes because you're not in alignment with the offer and your audience. So there are things that you have to put into alignment in order to feel confident about selling your work, whatever your work might be. The first is what you love to do. Honest to God, it has to be something you love to do. This goes back to what I've talked about probably at least three times in the last two weeks. It does not work to paint to the market. If it's not something you care about, that is communicated to your audience and they'll back off. They're not gonna be that interested. You might sell one or two, but you're not gonna sell a whole lot. It's got to be something that you care about, something that you have curiosity about, something that intrigues you. So that's the first thing. Second thing to get it into alignment is to think about something that you do better than anybody else goes back to unique ability again because in order to market that successfully whatever it is you've got to stand out above the noise so think about the last time you were on social media some of y'all are on there right now so if you when was the last time you were on social media and saw an ad probably the last time you were on social media right so there are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of ads and offers being put in front of people all the time. That creates a tremendous amount of noise. It sounds like static on the television set. You remember when TVs went offline way back in the, the dark ages and all you'd get after midnight was snow and static sound? That's what all that noise sounds like. The only way to rise above that is to make sure you're in line with your offer and with your audience. So you need to be doing something that you love to do, offering something you love to do. It needs to be something that you're better at than anybody else, niche down. This is where the riches are in the niches. Get really niche down and it's not so hard to stand out.
because there won't be nearly as many people trying to do what you do. There are thousands of landscape painters out there. I'd venture to say hundreds of thousands. But if you begin to narrow that down even further, for example, it's a whole lot easier to stand out. Third thing, you need to create an offer that people need. They have to need it. They have to need it badly. It has to solve a problem. And that's one of the first stumbling blocks that I see students fall into, is they're not sure how their art satisfies a need. Well, there are all kinds of needs that people have, their internal needs and their external needs. And the truth is most people buy based on emotion and then they justify that, that purchase by logic. So if you can think of the reasons that people would emotionally connect and need your work, it's gonna be a whole lot easier to find that audience to be in align with, alignment with. So you've got to know what problem your art solves. And yes, art solves problems. So can anybody think of a really fundamental, external, completely pragmatic need that art fulfills? Something pretty mundane, but it's truthfully a need. Type it into the comments if you could, there you go. Melanie C wins the day there, and so does Ann Davis. It fills a space on the wall to cover the wall. So on a very pragmatic level, your art fills a need when it takes up space on the wall and it transforms that space. So that's a very pragmatic need. What's an emotional need that art might have? And Beth types in memories. Melanie says delight. Absolutely, Carol says beauty. All of those things are emotional needs. Now, you're probably going to connect first on the practical level and then on the emotional, but you wanna to appeal to both. So you gotta have that thing that people need and you've gotta make it really clear why they need it. And don't keep it way up here, bring it down to a real nuts and bolts level. So address it really clearly and you'll be that much more successful. The fourth thing, and without this fourth thing, it's not gonna work. It's got to be something they're willing to pay for. So you can have an audience that just is totally in love with what you're painting, with what you're marketing, with what your offer is, but if it's an audience that can't afford to spend the money on it, it doesn't matter how much they need it. So you've got to make sure that it's something that they will pay for and that they can afford. So there are lots of people who are not going to pay for certain things. They're not your target audience. You're not gonna to appeal to everybody. You've got to get in alignment and meet those four criteria. Once you've met those four, then you are aligning with your audience and what their needs and wants and desires are, and it becomes a whole lot easier to sell. And the reason that it becomes easier to sell is you're not having to sell. So did you get that one? If you're in alignment, you don't have to sell. You just have to invite. And this is where so many people mess up. They totally mess up because what they do is that they thrive on hope marketing and hope marketing doesn't work super well. So I see people do this all the time and it makes me absolutely crazy because they're not following through the whole way. They're stopping at step one. And what they do is they post a painting on social media or on their website. They pop it up there and then they wait for people to run up and purchase. But they don't do that and it's crickets. And so they give up and they don't do anything more to make that effort to invite their audience to purchase, to invite their audience to participate in that offer. So you've got to go through all of the steps and not just do what I call plopping your work online and expecting magnificent things 
to happen. Posting your work online, whether it's on your website or on social media, is just the first step in that process of launching your art. Just the first step, not the last step. It's the opening of a conversation. Because what you're trying to do with your audience is build a relationship and open a conversation so that it becomes natural when you make an offer for people to desire it because you've already checked ahead of time to make sure it's something they need, to make sure it's something they want, to make sure it's something that they can purchase, that they either have the wherewithal to purchase it or they want to purchase it. Purchase it. Need and desire are two different things. You want to mix, match up with both. So what people tend to do is that they do something we call push marketing. Anybody ever heard of push marketing before? You may not have. Push marketing is what hundreds of thousands of internet marketers do. It's the buy my stuff, buy my stuff. Here, buy my stuff. Look at my ad, buy my stuff. How many times do you get an ad on Facebook or Instagram from somebody that you've never seen before who's advertising the purchase of something, whether it's food, food boxes, it's an Amazon product, it's a new hairbrush, a new fill in the blank with whatever. And you have no relationship with this person. They are just somebody out on the internet who has targeted what we call a cold audience, means they have no contact with, have had no contact with them before, and are now pushing a product is the first step of the relationship. And the best analogy I can think of to describe that is like walking into a cocktail party and going up to the first person you meet and going, hi, my name is Mary Gilkerson, marry me tomorrow. That doesn't work really well. You know, that's not a way to build a relationship. What happens when you do that is people go, eh, weird, and they run for the door. So you have to build a relationship first and not go immediately from here's my product to let's get married. So instead, here's my offer and then have a conversation with a whole lot of conversation beforehand. So it's all about relationship building. And make sure you're not doing the drive-by dating thing because that don't work real well at all. And if you get enough comfort level built up with that relationship building, and remember I said it's a whole lot easier to do on the internet for those of us who are introverted, then it gets a whole lot easier when you finally get to the point of having something to offer because you've had this long runway to build up that relationship. So the, the stages of that are, are multiple. And you want to focus on pulling people in instead of pushing your product at them. So you see the difference there? Pull marketing, which is what I'm talking about. And pull marketing attracts your ideal audience in and it lets the people who are not in alignment go because what you have is not for them because you've gone deep into that narrow niche. You're not gonna to appeal to everybody, remember. You're just gonna to appeal to that narrow niche. So when you're doing pull marketing, it's not so overwhelming. And because you've got an offer that's in tight alignment, you stand out way above all of the rest of the noise. And the content that you create along the way helps to pull them in closer so that selling becomes pretty much unnecessary. You just make an offer. You just issue an invitation. Does that make sense to everybody so far? Excellent. Let me know if that, yes, absolutely. The curiosity is extremely important, Laura. Um, and building that relationship is extraordinarily important. So the, the three things that help you to get into alignment and to go through the process of pull marketing 
is you have to have that platform first because that platform is what helps you to attract the audience that's in alignment with what you're going to offer. And there are several stages in that process. And in fact, I've got a handout for y'all. Let me see if I can pull up the correct link here. And I'm gonna pop it into the chat roll and over into Facebook so that you can download it. This is the system, seven step system that I use myself and I teach within the Painter's Path, teach it with my students. So I want you to click that link and download it. Yes, Denise, I want you to download the handout. So I've got it in there at least once. I'm gonna type it in one more time just so we make sure everybody sees it. So download that handout because I wanna go over that system, that process. And this process has to do with First, identifying what you love goes back to those, those elements of getting in alignment. It's the mindset and then creating the other stages along the way that will get you into alignment. So I'm trying to give you all a second to download that um, handout. And if you've downloaded it, don't read all over it right now. We're going to go over each step. I want you to come back to me now. Make sure everybody's eyeballs back over here for a second because I'm going to pop it up and share it on the screen here so that you can all see it. So um, let's share the screen here. Find where I put it. There we go. So this is the Thriving Artist Roadmap and it's the system that I use myself. I developed it ooh, over trial and error over probably almost 10 years now. And what it's done for me using this system is getting me to the point where I can confidently go through the launch process and make an offer without feeling all that yuck, whether I'm offering a course or a workshop or a collection of paintings. It's the same system I use for launching all of those things. So we're talking about the launch mechanism. And that's a process that Jeff Walker came up with, but it contains three st big stages, and you're gonna see them develop here. It's the pre-launch, the launch, and then the offer. So we'll come back to that in just a second. So on that roadmap, the first two stages that are super important is to first, and you'll notice we've gone through these things. The first is to identify the limiting beliefs that you hold and reframe them so that you have the thriving artist mindset. You have to reframe the way that you think so you can build the confidence to get out there and make the art that's going to connect with your audience and then make the invitation and the offer. So mindset is the basis of everything else. You got to get your, your beliefs in alignment first. If you go out there and try to make an offer to your audience, say a new collection of paintings, and somewhere inside you don't believe they're good enough, you question whether you're good enough, and you question whether the price is too high, that's going to come across. And it's going to push people away instead of pulling them towards you. So it's critical that you get your mindset straight so that you can pull your ideal audience into you first. In other words, you got to get your own ducks in a row before you can go out and help anybody else. Kind of like on the airline when they tell you to pull the mask down for the oxygen and put it on yourself first before you reach over to help anybody else. You got to get yourself in good order first. Then once you have your, your belief systems worked out again, then you can think about where it is that you want to go. You have to identify a success path. If you have no goal in mind, you'll get nowhere. So where do you want to go? How do you define success? 
It might be like my student, Sheila, don't know if Sheila's on with us right now, Sheila, who wants to bring awareness to the beauty and the wealth that we have in our national parks. So she has created a project where she is going out and painting all of the national parks and then sharing those on her website and her social media sites to try to bring people out to visit the, the national parks and to be aware of what, what we have. It's not about selling the paintings, although she has sold some. It is for her all about building that awareness and creating a love for the national parks. What drives her is knowing what her mission is, what her success path is. So it's crucial to know what your success path is. I have another student whose mission is to transform people's lives around issues that have to do with the challenges they face, whether they are drug addiction, breast cancer, or a whole host of other challenges that they face. And while the money is important in enabling her to continue to do her work, the why and the way that she's judging her success is how she, much she is able to reach and transform those lives. So it's not just about the money, but remember that the money is not a bad thing. You have to make enough money to be able to go make more art, to be able to make the change you wanna be in the world. But you gotta know what that change is. So it's well worth spending time thinking about what you want your impact to be. Nail down and choose a success path that's in alignment with who you are and why you are. There are a whole lot of them out there to choose from. So then, the third step is process. And this is where a lot of artists go, I just can't do this. Yeah, you can. I call BS. We all can because we've got processes we already use. And those processes are the things that we do to go about to make a paint, how we go about making a painting. And where I had a big transformation in my own painting practice and business when I, was when I realized that business was just another creative process. So I want you to see that as well, that processes in business are just as creative as the ones in painting. And they enable you to have that impact. So processes are core habits, rituals, core patterns, the things that you do, routines, that help to move you along to being productive and reaching that audience. So it's the core habits, routines, and processes that will lead you along the path to success. And it's setting out those goals and how you're gonna get there. Super important. Notice that the fourth one here is your art. Your art's crucial. And you wanna be the best artist you possibly can be. You want to make as compelling a painting as you possibly can. And you don't wanna wait until 30 years in the future when you might be making a compelling painting. You wanna look at which of your paintings right now are the most compelling, that speak to people the most, that reach the audience that you've identified. So you wanna make a consistent body of work. And yes, that requires focus. You have to narrow in on your niche. You've got to niche down. So niching down is on your audience, but the first step to niching down is niching down on your work. And know that you can park some things to the side and come back to them later. So niche down, niche down on your work. Create consistent processes around your painting as well. Step number five is build a community of raving fans. You've got to create that community in order to have an audience that you build a relationship with. And I think the word community is super important because it implies that relationship that I was talking about that develops when you're in alignment with your audience and your offer. Community can't be created any other way. 
and community implies relationship between you and your audience and your audience with you. It's not anonymous. What people are buying is not just the thing, they're buying an experience with you. And you need to create the road, the breadcrumbs, the trail that leads them to you. And then nurture that audience through content that doesn't demand they buy anything. That's the pre-launch content stage of Jeff Walker's launch process, the one that I teach my students. So pre-launching means that you share, notice that word share, it goes back to that relationship again. You share your content with your audience long before you make that offer of the product. And that's what builds no like and trust factor. You're not gonna get that with a cold audience. You've got to build the relationship first. So that pre-launch content, that's the breadcrumbs. The breadcrumbs are the, the pieces of information, and that info could be images of paintings. It's the pieces of information that draw your audience and community down the path towards your offer. It's the pull factor. You pull them by laying breadcrumbs that lead them along the way. You pull them by having meaningful, authentic pre-launch content. Then when you launch, that is when you answer objections, things that might hold people back, and you present the invitation to your offer. So you have to develop the offer first, and the best offers are created through synergy between you and your audience. So for some artists, that means talking to their audience about what they're gonna paint. For other artists, it means having a dialogue with their audience about why they do what they do. But in whatever form that dialogue takes, the best offers are created jointly between you and your audience. That's what makes an offer that converts super, super well. When you become so familiar with your audience, you know what their needs, likes, and desires are. It makes it sound like you know them better than they know themselves. And you probably do because you've been listening with your ears in the process of having that conversation with them and building that relationship so that you have a sincere offer, an authentic offer. Authentic gets tossed around a lot and I'm hesitant um, in some ways to use the word, but substitute sincere there. Sincere is real and meaningful and not something that's just superficial. You're trying to have an impact there. That's what crafts the offer that converts. Then the last stage is that launch. It's how you present the offer. It's the invitation that you make to the audience. And if you think about um, a parallel would be, for example, when any online catalog company announces that they have a promotion coming up. They have a new collection of fill in the blank. It might be clothes. So there are some online catalogs or some physical catalogs I love getting. And when they tell me they have a new promotion or a new collection, my ear perks up and I go to check it out. And that's letting me know they have an invitation to purchase something new. And that launch, that reveal can be around a new collection. It can be free shipping. There are all sorts of ways to structure that. It could be around paintings. It could be around books. It could be around prints. It could be around a project. It could be all sorts of different things. It could be a course. And as some of y'all teach, it could be an, a work, live workshop but you want to create an event around it. Guess what? You are in one right now. If you, any of y'all notice that there's a process in there that I followed in creating this actual workshop, 
that this is the event that is launching the opening of the painter's path. So it, if it's valuable content, even if people are not ready to purchase whatever the offer is at that moment, it helps to build the relationship and it doesn't feel so salesy when you finally make the invitation. Now I have an eighth step here on the handout and that is to amplify. And amplification is going back and rinsing and repeating, tweaking the things that worked really well and amplifying them and pruning off the things that don't work. It's as important in business as it is in a painting. So when you are through with that first pass of a painting, one of the things that I always tell my students to do is sit back. Sitting is as important as painting. And look at the painting with fresh eyes. What do you need to hold on to and what do you need to let go of? Same thing with launching your work. What do you need to hold on to and what do you need to let go of? That reflection process is another one that a lot of people leave out. It's usually pretty easy to see where things have fallen flat if they do when you go back and do that reflection process. And then you can make a small change and it becomes a whole lot easier. So does everybody see how that creates a fairly logical system and a way to um, create that onward momentum and begin to build an offer that leads to an invitation that doesn't feel salesy? Yes. Um, Melanie says, can a consistent body of work be two different mediums, say watercolor and acrylic? Absolutely it can be, especially when they're around the same theme and your paintings are around the same theme, Melanie. So if you're working around the same issue, I do that too. I have two main mediums that I use and it's still the same consistent body of work. That makes a huge big difference. You just need to have a consistent body of work in order to do that. And then present that to the world. And the reason you want it to be consistent is that's what helps create that narrow niche there. Does that make sense? So very important to follow through that process. By following through that, pro before I had that process, go back up a minute. Before I did, had that process, I did a whole lot of uh, let's post it and see what happens kind of stuff and crickets would happen. What made the huge big difference for me was realizing that I needed the platform and I needed the audience before I made the offer. That I needed to build those first two things before I could get to the offer point. And that when I did that on a consistent basis, that it made it a whole lot easier to make the offer in a way that didn't feel say, salesy and slick and kind of gross, because nobody wants to do that. And most of us, at least initially, are not comfortable enough with selling to be able to do that without having that process to follow. So that's the process of pull marketing. And that, that final stage launching is leaving the breadcrumbs that lead people to buying your product. Sally says, I need to find my unique ability before I can do that process. It's a, a journey to find what your unique ability is. It's already there. You just need to go through the process of digging in to find what it is, Sally. It's there, I promise you. But you just need to uncover it. And that's where, you know, you can, you can spend months doing that on your own. You know, you could take all the things that we've covered in the, the three videos that we've got here, and you could actually take the roadmap that I gave y'all today, and you could use that roadmap to create and implement your own thriving studio practice and business. And it will absolutely work. It's just gonna take time. Because when you do it on your own, 
you got to do a lot of trial and error. But if you'd like to do it together, we can shorten that journey. So that's what the painter's path is. That course is my way of shortening the journey for my students so that they can get from that first step up there of the mindset to the final step at the end of launching and then amplifying their impact of deciding what their success path is and creating a plan for getting there. So this painter's path is a 12 week online program that opens today for registration. So I know we have a couple of people who are on right now who are members of the painter's path who've already gone through the program or are in the program right now. I think Ann Brown is on, Lisa Atkinson, if you are on, you're in there. So let me see if I see who else is in the program right now. I think Susan is in here, Susan Feinside is in here and she's a member of the program. So the painter's path is literally your path to defining and achieving your success and how you're gonna make an impact on the world. And what is involved in that course are eliminating at the beginning those mindset issues that hold us back. So the, switch the screens here just a second. Um, let me share here. Here we go. So having processes makes it so much easier to make that journey. And the processes that are in the painter's path are the ones that I've worked out and trialed and keep on tweaking and amplifying myself in order to have a bigger imp uh, impact with my work in the world. And it's what's enabled me to go from full-time academic college art professor for more than 20 years to being a full-time thriving painter in my own studio practice and business, to being able to leave behind academia and step out on my own and have a larger impact in the world without feeling overwhelmed. And I'm on a mission to show y'all how you can do that yourselves. You can do it by following what we've outlined in the, the videos and the live workshop and taking a little bit longer to get there, or you can speed that process up by joining us in the Painter's Path. It's a 12-week program, and we run via cohorts. We have an online portal. It's highly, highly interactive. We've got our own secret Facebook group, private Facebook group, where people share their ideas and empower each other to thrive so that you can make art that you love, that feeds your soul, and has a big impact in the world. So there are three keys to being able to do that. Three things that I teach that I think are unique in the world of teaching people how to do business online. It's my own unique ability. Most people, when they're teaching the business of art, focus purely on the art marketing. And what frustrates me about that is that people don't see how the things interlock together. You need to grow all three legs of the stool, all three pillars of the platform at the same time. If you don't, you will end up standing on one leg. So making paintings that you love, creating art that is compelling, that speaks to people, is the first thing there. It is hugely important but it's only one part of the process. You can make the most compelling paintings around, but if you don't develop an audience, you're not gonna have an impact. So it's important to make those compelling paintings. That's the first leg of the stool. The second leg is the building an engaged audience of your ideal fans so that you can turn them into collectors. Having that audience and building that relationship gives you the second leg of the stool. But any of y'all who've ever sat on a stool know that it requires one more leg in order for it to be stable. And that leg 
is the one that is the inner work. It is the inner game of being a painter. It's the mindset. It's moving beyond that starving artist stereotype to the thriving artist stereotype. It's letting go of the idea that you can't make money with art, that it's bad to make money with art. And if you do make money with art, you're a sellout. Because the truth is, artists should not be starving. An artist should be able to have an impact on the world. We are all creative beings and we all have something to contribute. And with the advent of the internet, we all have the tools and the resources to get there. We can get there faster, we can get there slower, but we all have access to the tools that we need. And they're not huge, big, fancy tools. They're tools that are relatively easy to access. You don't need some fancy CRM system. That's a customer relationship management system. You don't need that. You need an email list. You don't need a fancy, fancy pants shopping cart that interlocks with all other kinds of moving parts. You need a way for people to buy. A PayPal account will work for that at the beginning. You don't have to have the cutting edge website. You need a website that's good enough because done is better than perfect. And there are a number of different platforms out there that are affordable that are available to artists that don't require that you know all of the tap bells and whistles so that you can create your own three-legged stool around art, around work, and around living. What you get in the painter's path are, in essence, more than 50 videos. You get eight modules that cover those different steps along the roadmap that we went over earlier that literally walk you through each step along the way so that you can build your own thriving art business. It also includes my signature course, Composition, Color, and Light, and the course known as The Painter's Business that is not even available to be purchased anymore, that gets into the weeds of the nuts and bolts of building that platform that we've talked about, about your email list, your website, and building that social hub. So there are all, there's some strategies I've got around each one of those that make those a whole lot easier. That goes back to that systems part that I talked about earlier. The modules break out along those exact lines that we just talked about. Starting off with creating that thriving mindset, then choosing your own success path, and then developing the core um, routines and habits and processes that are gonna get you to that success. There's no one size fits all, and everybody doesn't need to be doing the exact same thing. You need to develop the ones that are gonna work for you so that you can rinse and repeat them. Then we walk through what it takes to create that compelling body of work, that successful, strong body of work, and how to create a movement and a community around what you do and pull in those ideal customers, that ideal audience, instead of pushing your work out towards them. And then design an offer that converts and launch it using the right system for you. There are all kinds of different ways to launch your offer. And you wanna pick the one that is most natural and comfortable for you. It can be all via email, it can be via video, it can be via social media. I know people who launch just using Instagram. The method is not what's so important as the overall strategy. Then you need to go back and evaluate, rinse, and repeat. The primary focus during the course is on how you can hit your identified success over the course of the next 90 days, over the course of the next three months to really move you along the path. The course includes a number of additional bonuses. So it's not just the painter's path itself, which is the complete painter's path success blueprint or roadmap that you've got in your hand already. It also includes six interactive coaching Q&A calls 
where we get on live together on Zoom, and not just in a webinar, but face to face, so that you begin to build the connection with the cohort that you're in and the support network that helped to lead you on the way, as well as being able to be held accountable by myself and the group for reaching that goal that you've identified. You can't fall through the cracks because we'll chase you down. So those live coaching calls, six live coaching calls are super important. We also have that private Facebook group where you are able to share what you're working on, get feedback from myself, my team, and the rest of the community. The first bonus, as I said, is composition, color, and light, because I want you to have the tools that it takes to create that compelling body of work. Some people start there. Other people already feel like they have that compelling body of work and start with building their platform. We've got playlists that will help you in this, this edition figure out where it is that you need to start. Where's your ideal beginning point? Second bonus, as I said, is the painter's business that gets into the weeds of how to create that platform. I have a third bonus that we added this summer, which is the Facebook Ads for Artists workshop, where I walk you through the stages and the materials that you need to set up a Facebook ad system for whatever it is that you are promoting and offering. Fourth bonus is the social media jumpstart. This is my process for really beginning to establish your social media hub. And it literally is step by step, walking you through how to begin to build that following so that you can then move people from social media to your website and email list. And the fifth bonus is the five day video challenge, which is an email challenge with the prompts that help you to create video content that you can post on either Instagram, Facebook, or directly to your website as a way to begin to build and enhance that relationship with your ideal audience. Now, all of those together are what create the package or the offer for the painter's path. And I have two students on here whose stories you can read a little bit more about. First is Jim Morgan, and then we have Teresa, who is a current student in the painter's path. So be sure to spend some time talking to them and they are both members of the Artwork Living free Facebook group, so hit them up with any questions you might have about the course. I also have a 30-day money-back guarantee because I believe that you shouldn't dive into something without having a way back out if it's not the right thing for you. So it's no questions asked. Once you get in there, you have 30 days to try the course out to see if it's a good fit for you. And then you have the chance to back out if it's not the right fit for you. I haven't had anybody do that yet. Not to say there won't be a first, but I want everybody to feel comfortable that they're not gonna be stuck with buyer's remorse tomorrow. So the cost of tuition for the painter's path the course, if you pay directly up front, is $19.97 if you make one single payment. But I do have a payment plan that allows for six months of payments of $3.97 a month. Or if you'd like to have even more hands-on help, you can join the Painter's Path Accelerator, which is my coaching mastermind program that runs for six months and has weekly meetings and allows you to get one-on-one -on -one coaching from myself and my team to help you get to your goals faster, to make sure that you implement the processes that we're covering in the painter's path and get it done. So whichever option is the right one for you, I would love to have you join the course and join our community of thriving artists. But remember that the way to get there 
the easiest way that I know of to get there is to follow that roadmap, the painter's path roadmap that leads from shifting your mindset, identifying your success path, creating those processes, making the compelling art, building that community, creating the offer that converts, and then launching it out into the world so that you have an impact. If you'd like to join us, here is the link to get more info. So when you click on that link, you'll be taken to the sales page where you can get more information on the course. So clicking that link will take you to the sales page. It doesn't take you to the checkout page, it takes you straight to the sales page. So you're not compelled right there to purchase right away. Andrea, you're on. Awesome. Andrea's in here. Andrea and Kathy Nettles both are members of the Painter's Path and have both accomplished a lot of great things. I'm really proud of what they have done. Here's the link for the Facebook group to the Painter's Path sales page. Andrea just got into her second gallery and I feel like shouting that one out big time. And Kathy has been developing an awesome new body of work that is really beginning to niche down. Um, and I'm so glad she says she's going to redo the whole course. Cool beans, Kathy, come back through it with us. That would be fantastic. So one of the reasons Kathy can go back through it is that once you join the painter's path, you have continued access to that course. That doesn't go away. So access to the course is for what they call the lifetime of the course. And what that means is that you can download it and have it forever. It means that as long as I'm offering the course online, you have access to the online course portal. It won't go away. So you can go back through it as many times as you want. And I know from my own personal experience of taking online courses, that going back through a second, a third, or a fourth time is one of the best ways to really hone in on your alignment with your offer and with your audience. So, Anne, what was your question? You said I answered it. Yes, you still get. Anne is also a member of the Painter's Path. Um, you still have access to the course. It does not go away if that was what your question is. It stays. So I would love to have anybody who is interested either email me at studio at marygilkerson.com if you have any other questions or share your questions here with us in the group. Um, Melanie, which answers did you have? Have questions on? Ugh, I just butchered that. Um, will it be offered again, Melanie says. I'm still working my way through composition, color, and light. So composition, color, and light is a part of the painter's path. So Melanie, the students who are in composition, color, and light get a discount on the painter's path. So they get access to it through a little bit different avenue than if you have not been through composition, color, and light. So for anybody who is currently in CCL, then make sure you shoot me an email and do not sign up for Painter's Path through the regular sales page. If you do, I'll catch it and back you up, but it's, it does not cost $19.97 to you because you are already a student and a component of the course. So, Awesome, Susan says she's gonna use the information to build her platform for the launch of her book. That is a fantastic idea. And I just wanna say, I know I have one who already has done that. And you might wanna reach out to her and get some information from her about that. She says, I've identified my niche in art and we'll use your teaching to move forward. Awesome, that is fantastic. That is my goal. I do not want to see anybody else out there struggle for as long as I did or struggle as long, much as I've seen some of my students struggle. We all can thrive. We do not have to starve. 
when I was just out of graduate school the first time, I moved to New York like so many other young artists, and I did starve at first. The internet wasn't around. I got super skinny. <laughs> And it was because there were so many other artists and I didn't have the tools to rise up above the noise. Literally, as I walked down Fifth Avenue looking for a job, trying to get into a gallery, it felt like every 10th person I passed was also carrying a portfolio. There were so many other artists that there was no way to really stand out stand up above that noise. The internet and online platforms give us the tools to do that. Um, Laura says, can we stay in artwork living even if you can't do the painter's path just yet? Absolutely, Laura. The free Facebook group stays. It's been around for quite a while and it's not going anywhere. So if you need to hang out here in the free Facebook group for a while first, that's not a problem. And join the painter's path when the time is right. Think about what will make the right time though. What do you need to have in place in order to be ready to do it? And ask yourself if that's one of those limiting beliefs that's in there, or if it's a real physical challenge that holds you back. Because the answer to that challenge depends on is it a belief system or is it a, a physical challenge thing? Awesome. So yes, you will not lose access to the group. And Melanie, I hope I answered your question there. Cindy says, will you be offering this course again in the future? Um, not for a while because once we offer it, we close the door. So it won't be offered again this year. Um, October is the last opening time for the Painter's Path for 2019. It'll open again later in 2020 because we close the doors so we can focus on the people who are in the course. This is not a course where there are going to be a thousand other people in there and you don't ever see the person who's teaching the course, me. I'm in there. So I know everybody's names and I know when people disappear. If you're one of the disappeared, I'm hunting you down. Um, and you can't fall through the cracks. So they're not, there's not space in there for a huge number. And when we close the doors, it's not because, um, it's not just because it's digital. I know a lot of people think, well, it's digital. You could have anybody in there. Not if you really want to make an impact. So what, we close the doors so that we can really focus on serving the people who are in the course. So. Awesome. We have a member who says, I think I'm at the right point to join up. I have a heavy, hefty, hefty case of imposter syndrome. I'm hoping the course will help with. That's fantastic. So Cindy says, what is the starting date? The starting date, you can dive right in as soon as you join. Our first live call is on Tuesday, October 15th. And it's for all members of the Painter's Path. So you can dive right into the course as soon as you join the course. The full course is available for it to you. That's a change that I've made this time. Um, I used to, and I still do that in my other courses. So I want everybody who joins to prove me right on this. I used to drip the modules. In other words, give everybody the next module one a week with implementation weeks in between so that everybody was on the same exact path, the same syllabus. But what I've come to realize is that people come in at different points. Some people need to focus on the body of work. Some people need to focus on the email list. Some people already have a website and they need to focus on creating their offer. So what we're doing this time is as soon as people join the course, they have full access to the entire course. And we've created a playlist that lets you help identify which modules you need to start with. Everybody needs to start with the basics. Everybody needs to look at module one and two about identifying their limiting beliefs and reframing them, 
and about what their definition of success is. That's the foundations. But from there, people can follow a different path so that I don't want people to feel like they're behind if they haven't gotten their website up yet and person C over here is already creating their offer. Everybody's on a different continuum there, but you have access to the full thing right away. Um, awesome. Yeah, Tracy, I think that you are further along the path than you realize. I know you're trying a lot of different um, subjects in your paintings right now. You're trying different mediums, but you are right on the edge there, my friend. So um, even if you don't join the course right now, I want you to pull up that roadmap and I want you to start mapping out how you're gonna get there because you're ready for the roadmap. Whether you feel like you're ready for the course yet or not is up to you. But I want you to step out beyond the, the hesitation there because you're way further down that road than you believe you are. I've been watching what you've done over the last year and you're definitely further down that road. Carol says, I feel I am too green as opposite of ripe to do such a deep course. I have another work. I don't paint nice, etc. I need to paint for a long, long time yet. Carol, I think I know which Carol you are. And in a lot of ways, I think you are at the same point as Tracy is. But you're, again, just like I said, you're further down that road than you think you are. When we were all together, because I'm guessing this is Carol from Paint Camp. When we were all together and we have all of the, the works out at that very end, your work hangs together as a body. When, and Tracy, I'm speaking for, for everyone out there who feels they're still exploring their paintings and their painting process, you will always be exploring your paintings and your painting process. I'm still exploring my paintings and my painting process. Your painting style, your paintings, your, the things you are interested in in your paintings will shift over time and they'll shift dramatically. If you look at a painting I did 20 years ago, 10 years ago, there's some common elements there, but they're really very, very different. So there's no they are there. There's no final stage at which you reach. And now you're ready to begin to build your audience. So even if you're not gonna join the course now, make sure you download that roadmap and make sure you begin to follow along it and establish how you're gonna get from number one to number eight and stay on top of it. Yeah, Tracy, I know you're in the process of putting your, your website together. So you've got an awful lot that's already, you know, a lot of boxes already ticked there. So I totally get that. Um, Laura says, are the classes in the middle of the day? If we work full time at something else, is there an obstacle to the course? No, there's not. Um, Laura, the, the course, the classes are asynchronous. So that means that they're videos that you can watch on your own time. You can make it fit into your schedule. So it could be whatever time works best for you. It could be early morning, it could be lunchtime, it could be midnight, because you can watch the videos at any time that you want to. The only part that's live are those live Q and A's. Now, those are super important. And I think the people that go the furthest, the fastest, are the ones who are the most engaged in the Facebook group, and on those live calls. So I think it's important to be able to do those as much as possible. So where we have scheduled those calls in the past is all at the same time in the late afternoon. And this time we are in all likelihood gonna be jumping that time around a little bit so that we can hit a good time so everybody will have at least two good times that fit for them. So the calls will not all be at the same time. 
so that we can spread them around and accommodate as many good times as there are for everybody. And there'll probably be at least a one or two bonus calls thrown in there too, generally because I can't resist. Those are my favorite part of the course. I love talking to people about the problems that they're having and how to solve those problems, how to make those challenges less and achieve more. So again, the Q&As are the only part that's live. If you don't have Facebook, if you don't like Facebook, that's okay. You don't have to join that Facebook group. You can still create that sense of community with everybody else in the course by joining in on those phone calls. Those calls are recorded and go into the course portal so that you can access them later and you can ask any questions you need to ahead of time if you know you're not going to be able to be there. So it, it doesn't matter whether you are on at one particular time during the day. You can access, when it, access it when it works for you. And one of the other things that I think is super important about online, it's one of the things that makes online an easier learning environment for a lot, of, actually there are a couple of things, easier learning environment for a lot of people. One is that um, you don't have to, you're not gonna get behind. There is no behind, especially when everybody's got a playlist or a checklist to go by that meets their more tailored needs. If you need to go out of town and you're gonna miss a, a week, you're still not behind. You pick up when you come back. So, and especially when you have access, ongoing access, you can go through at your own pace. If you wanna spend three weeks on one module, you can do that before you go further. So you don't have to rush through on everybody else's schedule. I think that's really important. Another reason that I think online learning works so well, and this is something I noticed, oh, fully 20 years ago. Um, I, was, I taught the first online course for the college that I taught at way back, further back than I, I like to admit. And when I first started teaching online, websites were really unusual. And we taught that entirely via email through an email list. Remember email lists, kind of like, um, or email group list. It's kind of like groups on Gmail. And what I noticed was that people who didn't feel comfortable in a live classroom situation feel empowered in an online situation and feel more comfortable asking questions. So online is a really great platform, no matter what it is you're studying. For all of us introverts, we feel like our questions don't get asked when we're in a big classroom situation. And MJ says, with ongoing access, will Q and A still be available to you? So I continue monthly Q and A's for the cohorts for a full year. So once you're through the, the regular Q and A's for the cohort that you're in, you get, continue getting Q and A's for the rest of the year, a monthly Q&A so that you don't fall off the wagon there, so that you can maintain that momentum. Because I think momentum is super important. And one of the easiest ways to maintain momentum is through accountability. And actually knowing that somebody is gonna ask you about what's been your big aha or success from the last month and what has been the big challenge means that you'll think about it beforehand. So I know I have a lot of students who say that at the beginning of the, the meeting as we start to talk. I knew I was gonna have to talk today, so I made myself go do something yesterday. Ideally, you're doing more than that, but it'll keep you on track a whole lot more than if you are just going through modules without any feedback or input from somebody else, so. Um, Beth says, I have a question for you or everyone. I'm a landscape painter. I am kind of on the line if somebody asks for a subject that isn't in my niche and offers money for this. Any advice for this? I don't want to sell out. I totally get where you're coming from on that. And it's not selling out. 
uh, I think that if it's something that you find intriguing, if it perks your curiosity, if it's something you find interesting, then it's worth doing. But it can also be a rabbit hole and it can sidetrack you if it's not. So if you're, if you're painting because somebody just is offering you money to go paint something that's totally unrelated to what you usually do, it'll dramatically get you off track really fast because you'll build up some internal resentment around doing something you don't find interesting. And the fact that you don't find it intriguing is gonna show in the work. So it's not gonna be as strong as if it were something that you did find intriguing. So I think the key to kind of stepping outside of your niche a little bit is to make sure it's still intriguing. I would probably say don't do it. And as much as possible, stay in your niche in order to really begin to build that depth in your work. So, awesome. Hey, Ann. Ann says, it's very helpful to have the challenges and accomplishments. It is. Um, it's one of the things that I enjoy the most about coaching calls that I have with my own coaches. And it's definitely one of my favorite parts of the Q and A's. When you can talk about in a safe space, challenges that you're facing in your painting practice or in your business, it is empowering. And the solutions frequently come just by articulating what the challenge is. So it's not just the power of being able to talk with me, it's also the power of the group. Because when you start towards a goal together, you're far more likely to get there, way more likely to get there. So I think it's really, really important. Oh, Virginia says, you have coaches too? Yes, ma'am, I do. <laughs> I definitely have coaches. Um, I am in two coaching masterminds. And one of them I've been in for five years now and the other for three years. And I would not be here where I am now with a multi six figure business if I had not done that. So yeah, everybody needs a coach because a coach holds you accountable. A coach asks you where you have you been? What have you been doing? What are your challenges? And they also help you to, and I think this is probably the most important thing I've gotten from them. They help you see your successes so you can go out and repeat them because a lot of times we're too close to it to see it. So yes, I definitely have coaches. And two that I have been um, in touch with for a really long time. And they are a critical part of, of my business. So definitely. Yeah, they are ongoing. Thank you, Tracy. I am so glad that you feel like I'm a great coach. Um, I love seeing people making progress. And you, my friend, have made tons of progress. So Tracy is a member of our Artwork Living Community membership and has been making, participating in every single challenge we have and has been growing her, her practice gangbusters. It's a pleasure to watch. So I wanna make sure I scroll back here to catch any other questions that people have. And let's see, get to the very beginning here. Um, MJ says, a few places you might recommend for archival prints. The main one I recommend, MJ, is a company called Printful.com. And that is who I use for any of those kinds of things, um, for archival prints. And they have a range of papers and surfaces and sizes. So I love working with them. And Lisa Atkinson, Woot woot again for sure. Number one on that list. Lisa is the one with the children's book that came out and it has hit number one. And I'm super proud of what she's doing. She has done a fantastic job of launching that on social media. So following Lisa, if you're interested in books, is fantastic. So Yes. Uh, thank you, Lisa. Lisa says it's the best investment I've made. That is um, awesome. That is the best kind of compliment for me to get. I love seeing people succeed and you're doing awesome work in the world. 
So let's see. Hey, Ree James, it's good to see you here. And Paula Martino. And Denise, this is going back to that question I asked about having a hard time selling, even when somebody wants the painting. It can be hard. What you don't want to do is what I have a, a really good friend who passed away about a year ago. And she was, we showed with the same dealer. Um, he's my main, the main gallery I work with. And he had a rule that she wasn't allowed to talk to collectors, except rarely. He had a really tight framework for her because she would talk collectors out of buying because she just was so humble. She had a really hard time believing that people really wanted her work. You can't be that person because you'll talk people out of it. So getting confident about what you're doing and confident about your work and the value of your work and the value of the impact you can make in the world makes it much easier to sell. And focusing on that impact is what makes the difference. Not on the money so much as the impact. How many people do you want to reach with paintings that delight them? How many children do you want to have hold that book in their hand and get introduced to the mystery and the magic of art? Think about the impact and that will empower you to make the offer. Beth says her problem is pricing and she feels bad about asking too much and ends up undercharging. That is a common, common thing that happens. And it's probably where I get on the soapbox the highest in the course. So I have a whole um, module in the painter's business on pricing and creating that offer. And there is a spreadsheet in there that I urge and harass and chase down people to fill out so that they can create a price list using the, the process that I outline in a way that they will feel comfortable because when you know what it costs you to make the art and what you need to be paid then you'll stop charging so little that you're getting paid a dollar an hour so you have to make a certain amount and even when i was teaching the same basic course in college because i taught this starting when i was teaching full-time at the college i required that they price it so they were making at least ten dollars an hour which was higher than the minimum wage. So if a 22 year old can price it so they're making at least $10 an hour, what should you be pricing it at so you make a decent wage? You've got to be able to sustain yourself. Anything less than that and you're doing harm to yourself. So Bob says, I always feel like I'm charging too much. You are not Bob, I know that for a fact. You need to look at what other people are charging and then you need to read what your customers are saying about your paintings, and you'll know that what you provide is worth that money, for sure. So pricing is big, very important. Um, Denise says, with your niche, do you repeat the same scene? I usually do the same scene up to three times. Um, probably not in the way that you're exactly talking about it, Beth. Um, I mean, Denise, I paint the same subject over and over and over again during different times of day, different weather, different times of year. So I'm painting the, the atmosphere, the color and light and not just the place. That becomes very much up to you. I have a student that paints the same subject multiple times in different sizes. Each one is unique though. And the offer that she creates is not just the painting or the print of the painting. It's also the story of the painting. And Kim, I don't know if Kim is on with us today, but Kim creates a book, a little booklet that goes along with the painting and she packages it up in a way that is incredibly unique so that the experience, the offer that she creates is that whole process of receiving this gift and opening it up and having the painting and the booklet and a card and a poem and feeling loved because that's what her art is all about. So she loves all over her customers. And when you do that, then you're making magic, then you're doing a service and then you're having an impact. So I think it just depends on what you're doing there, Denise, whether that will work for you. 
Um, John James Audubon, the great painter of the natural world, 19th century painter who painted the birds and the, the animals of North America, painted what he called pot boilers. He had three or four compositions that he would paint over and over again because he knew they would sell whenever he needed to raise money. I don't think there's anything wrong with that if that is a system that works for you. So you have to figure out what you want your impact to be. Audubon used his pot boilers as a way, pot boilers and putting food on the table, as a way to fund his bigger work, what he considered his mission, which was to document the birds and the animals of America and bring them into the homes of the people of America and Europe. That was where his market was. So he was really clear on what he was trying to do and how he was going to get there. It's one of my favorite examples of a thriving artist. So Susan says, I just purchased a new skincare product on a motion today and justified the purchase later. I think we all do that at one time or another for sure. So pay attention to why you buy over the next week and think about what's impacting you and making those purchasing decisions. Virginia said, I found that artwork in a hospital is uplifting and healing and hospitals are aware of that too. That is a real function of artwork in hospitals. Most hospitals have a collection and they actively go out and commission artwork, sometimes original artwork from artists, Sometimes they commission reproductions from a printing company of artwork that they find tranquil and healing in theme because studies have shown that when people look at art that is tranquil and feels healing and harmonious, they heal faster. There's a transformation for you. Um, MJ says memory of place. Absolutely. That's one of the strong selling points in my work. So it's very, very important. And absolutely, Laura says curiosity. That definitely works as well. Ginger says, should we post a price when we post a painting on social media? And usually I would say no to that. It, the price probably should be revealed on your website or your email list and not on social media itself, but there are always exceptions to the rule. I know an artist who sells almost entirely via Instagram and Insta stories, and she has the prices listed there because she has connected her shopping cart to Instagram so people can purchase directly in that social media platform. But in general, I would not do that. I would let the price be revealed on the website. Melanie says she posts the painting and supplies the price on request. That's, that's definitely one as, way to go on that. Ruth, awesome Ruth. You can, if you just joined, you can see the, the earlier sessions on the replay. So you'll get a replay link. And let's see who else is question I haven't answered yet. Laura says, I'm now seeing I've been pulled into the launch phase of several artist processes. Yeah, I bet you have. And you probably, not just on artist processes. So if you have watched um, it or seen any advertisements for something like Pottery Barn, Crate and Barrel, or Williams and Sonoma, you've been through a launch process. So you've probably been through launch processes for artist artwork for artist courses, for clothing, for products, for movies. A movie is one of the best examples. When you see a trailer for a movie, that is pre-launch content. They are trying to get you hooked so that you want to go see the movie and you get excited about it beforehand and they build up, build up excitement and momentum and they drip out little bits of content without telling you the whole story. And the only way you can get the whole story is to go to the movie. People do that with books as well. So watch for those launches that you're out, see out there that you may not have been aware of. It's a process that really, really works. Yay, Lisa, I'm glad you've learned so much and you're going back through, that is awesome. 
And Denise says, I don't always have a dependable internet connection for online courses. I have metered satellite internet and can't get unlimited. It's the perks of living in the middle of the forest. Oh, I would love to live in the middle of the forest. It's really a healthy place to be. What you can do, um, Denise, is download the videos and then watch them offline. And that generally works for people who have um, less than stellar internet service in order to be able to um, work through the different modules. Um, Claire says, can you explain why you said you do not like Fine Art America? I've just got some friends that have had bad experiences with them. So without going into more details than that, um, I think there are lots of platforms out there that have very solid reputations. And I just don't make recommendations for a platform where I have not had or can't talk about a really solid experience with them. And I've had really good experiences with Printful and with um, Zazzle. And I'm trying to think of who else I've printed stuff with. There's one more and I can't think of the name of it right now. The only one I use at this point is Printful.com just because they are so easy to work with. Um, and oh, that's the question you had, Anne. Awesome. So Anne says, if we're in it now and we haven't finished, how much longer do we have? You have until you finish, and then you go back through it again and again and again. So you get continued access to it. Um, Carson says, Camille Mayer from Facebook says, do you have recommendations on a format of creating a portfolio? Yeah, um, portfolios need to be digital. So um, printing or when you're creating a portfolio, you need to be able to pull it up quickly in order to show it to galleries or dealers or curators. It needs to be something you're not fumbling around on. Now, Andrea has used um, Instagram as her portfolio because she hasn't gotten her website up yet. And so she used her Instagram account to upload a portfolio so she could share that with her first potential dealer. <coughs> and ideally, you eventually want to have that on your website. But a lot of people use an iPad to do that or their phone. But what you don't want to do is print a portfolio anymore. Andrea is suggesting PS Print as a print resource. PS Print is great for printing things like business cards, um, cards that are going to be mailers. They are an upfront printing service. In other words, when you print with PS Print, you order X number, you pay for it, and they ship them to you. When I'm talking about things like Fine Art America and um, Printful, I'm talking about print on demand, where it doesn't cost you upfront to be able to offer that as a service. So you upload your image and you create the offer and you get a button or a link that people can click to purchase the print and they ship it to them and you don't have to pay for it until somebody else pays you. So it makes it much, much easier. David says, this workshop has been for me about self-empowerment. Oh, and thank you so much, Mary. You are most welcome, David. I am thrilled when artists feel more empowered because you've all got something that's a creative gift and the world needs it. We need a lot more of it, especially in tough times. So get out there and share your gift. Um, MJ says, much of what I do is digital. Would this work for me? Absolutely. So you could be um, like one of our students, Yvonne, and primarily be working in digital media. D Yvonne is a professional photographer and uses digital media to create paintings as well as physical paintings. So yeah, it works for digital products as well as for physical products. It's about creating the platform, creating the audience, and then an offer that resonates with that audience. And that's true, actually, no matter what it is you're selling. You could be selling donuts and the system would work for you. 
that becomes its own sort of performance art. So I just am not qualified to speak to people who make donuts. I'm a whole lot more interested in particular in empowering artists. Um, let's see, I think I've answered Cindy's and Laura's. Make sure I'm not skipping any here. Let's see. Um, Somebody saying, do I need to have an ABN before starting this course? I'm not sure what an ABN is. So type that in and let me know what an ABN is because I'm not sure what that is. Is that a, are you talking about a college degree? Definitely not. Uh -uh. So let me know what it is that an ABN is and I'll be happy to answer your question. Um, what you need to start the course is a desire to be empowered. You don't have to be, uh, be all the way down the road to creating that body of work. You could dive into the mindset and your goals, your success path, and then head over to composition, color, and light and work on that developing compelling paintings and develop a series, building a series first, and then come back to working on website and email list. Oh, Anne, thank you. She says, I love the community and the support from the group too. That is awesome. Um, Melanie says $20 an hour on average awesome sauce that is a minimum good good deal um everybody should be thinking that same way because if a st college student at 22 is making 10 an hour at the bare minimum as a, a professional artist you need to be making 20. that is a good spot to go and yeah you know, denise the charging per square inch is absolutely what i do too but in order to create the rate per square inch you need to know how much you're going to want to make per hour. It's a, it's a formula. Um, Tracy says, do we need professional photos of our paintings to print from? I only have my phone camera. If you're going to make prints, um, uh, archival prints, reproductions to sell, chances are pretty good that you could do it with your phone if you use a tripod and good lighting. It's not the optimal situation, but it can certainly get you started. And I would just think about how you would price those. You would just wanna make sure you get really good photos and phones have really good resolution. If you use a tripod, use really good lighting, there's no reason, reason why you can't get a high enough quality to print from. I've definitely done that. Um, it's easier with a DSLR camera, but it definitely can be done with your phone. And Peggy says, can't your website be your portfolio? It can if you have it all done and it's all in order so you can pull it up quickly. It can absolutely form the basis of your portfolio. Ree says, I'm working through my first 30 day challenge and boy am I loving, learning a lot about what I love and favorite practices. That is awesome. Yeah, dive into the color course dive into ccl first re i think that would be a good step forward for you and then when you're ready for the painter's path you can do that as well and ann says that she's made art a priority in her life i am glad to have been helped a part of that Anne, and it has been super exciting to see you become more confident about selling your work and you do it on a regular basis and I think the first time you really realized how much you could do that was last year when you, about this time of year, when you started working on the holiday challenge and creating that first launch of your work when you had the, the um, open studio and sold so many paintings. That was fantastic. Carol says, what is better to sell physical paintings framed or unframed? Um, I sell um, unframed online because it's easier to ship and because most people when they're buying online have an idea of what kind of frame they want to put on it. When I'm showing in a gallery, they're framed. So it depends on the situation. Okay, ABN, that's your business registration. That depends entirely on location. So one thing I do not cover in the course 
are the legal aspects of starting a business because there are so many resources out there for that already that are free and they're entirely dependent on your geographical location. So for example, where my business is located in Columbia, South Carolina has different rules than in Atlanta, Georgia, which has different rules than Washington, DC, which has different rules than Vancouver, Canada. So there's no way I could speak to all of those different rules. But in general, when you're opening a business, you need some sort of business license and tax number. So you need to check with your local small business agency or council, your local municipal council usually will have that information. So I absolutely help people find where to find that information, but I can't speak to what the individual needs are of different locations because those are legal processes that change so fast and are so space and place specific. Yeah, Australian business numbers. Um, you would be most likely a sole trader, what is called a sole proprietor in the US. Although I know people who set themselves up as a limited company. And some people even do it as, um, I'm trying to think of what my, my coach is Australian. One of my coaches is Australian. And I'm trying to think of what James does. I think he has it set up. It's a different format that we don't have here in the US and I can't remember what it is he uses, but it's not just as a company, it's in a trust. It's some sort of trust company designation. So yeah, it just depends. Um, and says, how do you track the time? I know it's more than mixing and painting. You do it at the beginning and then once you've established a general um, outline of it, as far as pricing goes and then you average it across the, the general spectrum of the artwork. I don't keep a record anymore of how much time I spend on an individual painting. I have a price list that I go by. Now what I do as far as figuring out how I'm gonna spend time on what area of my practice, I try to calendar out studio time, calendar out marketing time, calendar out teaching time. If it's on the calendar, I'll get it done. So that's super important. And that's definitely what I promote in um, coaching my students. So when I'm, I have a coaching student, we work on calendaring out what you need to get done. It's surprising what an impact that has on how much you get done. So you are most welcome, Beth. Awesome. So use the information I've already given to you and sell some of those paintings so that you can come hang out with us. Um, you don't need to have the ABN to do the course. Thank you, um, whoever typed that in. You don't have to have your business license before you start the course because you're learning how to set a course up. That would be something that you'd want to do before you launch your first work, before you exchange money with somebody. But you definitely don't need a business license in order to do the course. So, hope that makes sense. Um, claiming the cost of the course for taxes, yeah, that's, that's a different designation. If you are acting as a sole proprietor um, here in the States, you can deduct the cost of the course as professional development. And I'm not sure what all you would have to have designated in Australia in order to be able to do the same thing. So whatever it would take to set yourself up as a sole proprietor or a sole trader would be what you would need in order to be able to, du to deduct the course. So I don't know if they would measure from the moment that you get your business license or to the moment you begin the process of creating the business. So um, RLM says, so we can join the CCL course and then later join the main course. Yes, you can. Yes, you absolutely can. So let me make sure I've caught all of the questions over here. Carson, if there's anything else in the Facebook group, let me know because as usual, it's not sh uh, giving me all of the comments, just the last ones. 
just the ones made in the last few minutes there. So if there's anything else that comes to mind after we hop off, be sure to send me an email at studio at marygilkerson.com or over in the free Facebook group, Artwork Living, tag me in there and I'll be sure to come back in and check. Carol says, but I repeat the first day of the course. The first day of the course is as soon as you join the course. In other words, you have access to the full course as soon as you join. The first live Q&A is next Tuesday, October the 15th. So that's when the first meeting is. The course closes for enrollment on Friday, this Friday, the 11th so that we can focus on the people who have joined the course. So the course is open for enrollment through midnight on Friday, the 11th, midnight New York time, since I'm on New York time. So thank you for joining me and thank y'all for being here and thank you for putting yourself on the road to being a thriving artist whatever stage you're at right now is where you're supposed to be and you have the tools already to take the next step so take the next step let me know what you're going to do as the next step and share it in the facebook group or once you get the replay link share it in the comments there or just shoot me an email let me know what your next step is because everybody each one of you has a next step happy painting everybody i look forward to talking with you again soon bye bye for now oh rlm wanted the link for ccl let me get that to you and i'll pop that into the course I mean, into the chat roll right now. And I have that in 15 different places. You are most welcome, Bob. And Diane, you'll get the replay. Um, you're in the Facebook group. You can get that right away. As soon as we hang up, you'll be able to get hold of that. So I know I have that. Oh, it's over in my email. Hang tight for just a second here and I will pull it up. I'm afraid to just tell you what it is for fear that I will send you to the wrong place. Here we go. Thank you, Carson. That is it. You read my mind. Awesome sauce. Thanks, Carson. So um, RLM, Carson has typed it into the chat roll. That's the correct link. And Re, that would be the one for you that goes over composition and color. And that's a great place to start. And it leads towards the painter's path when you're at the right spot for that. So happy painting, everybody. Take care. And I hope to hear from you soon. I want to know what that first step is. Bye-bye for now.